Good evening. Thank you for coming. My name is Shauna Lawson. I'm the Assistant Director for Alumni Relations and Annual Giving at UW-Tacoma. We're glad to have you here today with us this evening at our virtual alumni speaker series. Um, we will start with the Share the Land Acknowledgement. Uh, we recognize that all of us at UW-Tacoma learn, live, and work on or near the ancestral homeland of the Coast Salish people. In particular, we are situated on the traditional territory of the Puyallup. As people on this occupied territory, we have a responsibility to acknowledge the land, the ancestors who have cared for this land since time immemorial, and all our indigenous connections today. We also have the responsibility to acknowledge the histories of dispossession and forced removal that have allowed for the growth and survival of this institution. In light of this history, let us take active efforts to partner with our indigenous community members and neighbors as we continue our work together as a community of learners, leaders, and educators. So um, during this uh, series, we ask that you remain muted during the interview portion. After the interview, if there is time, we will take questions via the chat. If you experience any technical difficulties at all, please note it in the chat and we will assist. Now I will take the time to turn this over to our interviewer. Her name is Alexander Geronimo. She's a communication major and business administration minor student. She is also a member of the student organization ECHO, which is the jazz and hip hop dance club at UW Tacoma. Thank you, Alex. I'll turn it over to you. And thank you, Shana. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. It is my pleasure to introduce our alumni speaker, Angela Suresh. Angela Suresh is a first-generation Indian-born American who graduated from the University of Washington Tacoma with her Bachelor of Arts in Mass Media Communications and a minor in Nonprofit Management and Administration. In her time at UW Tacoma, she was the news editor of The Ledger, where some of her most notable pieces included interviews with former President Barack Obama, Governor Jay Inslee, Congresswoman Pamela Jayapal, and Edward Snowden. She also carried internships at what was formerly known as the Brook and Jubal Show, the United Nations, and Sprinkler. After graduating, Angela went on to pursue her graduate degree from Johns Hopkins University and recently has been accepted at Penn State as a PhD candidate for strategic communications. She currently works at Boeing as a communication specialist focusing on culture and values and is also a national board member for the Federation of Malayali Associations of Americas. Since graduating, Angela has received several notable awards, including the 425 Business Magazine 30 Under 30 Honoree and the India Press Club of North America's Presidential Award. She is also currently being vetted for the Biden-Harris Administration position of Public Affairs Specialist. Now for some of our questions. Angela, please tell us about the company you work for, what your role is, what you do there, and how and why you decided to get involved with Boeing. Yeah, well, first and foremost, thank you, Alex, for the introduction, and thank you all for having me here today. As I've mentioned over and over again to everyone and anyone, really, um, I'm quite humbled to be a part of this alumni series and speaker series, uh, simply because, for one, I am that first generation South Asian individual and proud of it. And two, um, I am proud of the legacy that I sort of created at UW Tacoma. Um, it's led me to where I am today. I, I will say that the foundation and the tools that uh, UW Tacoma teachers, mentors, friends and um, security guards custodians anyone really has really kind of guided me to being the person that I am today um, to your question I am, I am currently working at Boeing as one of their communications and branding specialists uh, particularly focusing on the culture and values um, on the enterprise corporate communication side uh, what I kind of do day to day varies there really isn't a certain routine it evolves um, Boeing is a global, if not international company, company that is going through quite a um, crisis, I guess you can put it that way, but also we're working to rebuild a reputation with the people. Um, part of my job is to really focus on engagement with the employees and also just focus on internal communication aspects. And that, that being said, it's more or less kind of focusing on the global equity, diversity and inclusion aspects, as well as just sort of building up engagement, really focusing on what it is that the employees want to be heard and spoke or really want to be, um, I guess, listened to, as well as just sort of having what we like to call uh, the seek, speak and listen um, sessions. And I sort of lead those sessions at the company. Um, as I mentioned, my day varies. Uh, some days I am just absolutely slammed with work in terms of writing, um, a lot of policy, um, a lo and then some days it may be press releases. It could just vary. And that all being said, um, I, I, I got these tools from University of Washington Tacoma. Uh, 
it happened by accident. Let's put it that way. I never really foresaw myself uh, going into one corporate company or another. I actually will transparently put out there that um, I was actually kind of trying to figure out where it is that I wanted to end up. Um, I thought I was going to be a journalist. If, and I realized actually by entering Boeing that the majority of journalists, I guess, across the country end up at Boeing at some point or another. <laughs> and so um, that came as a shock to me um, simply because I, I thought journalism, you could only go through the New York Times or whatever it may be, um, at the Washington Post. But the fact of the matter is journalists, writers, communicators, storytellers can end up anywhere that they want to essentially uh, excel at. And um, for me to end up at Boeing, it, I guess it kind of came as fate almost. Um, my father actually came as an immigrant here and his first job was working for a startup aviation company as a salesman. And uh, reflecting upon that today and where I am today, I ended up one of the, uh, the leading aviation company in the world. And um, I just kind of think that it, it was meant to be. And so, and that too, in this sort of field, in this industry, um, I'm just really happy to be here and end up at Boeing and create a legacy for them as well. Thank you. I really loved hearing about um, the way you put it um, and when you start off in communications and you feel like you know where you want to go, like you think that there's just one or a few set pathways, but then it opens up to so much more, but you don't know that until like a little later on. So I wanted to ask a little more about your role um, for Boeing. Like how do you implement diversity and equity in the work that you do? I would like to say, and I, I like I mentioned before, that first generation, my cross-cultural heritage, that background has always sort of led me to doing uh, these various variety sorts of kind of things. And the one word that I like to use is uh, multi-potentialite. Um, that multi-potentialite in the sense that I can do anything that I put my mind to. And I guess that kind of comes to with the work that I do when it comes to diversity and inclusion, especially in the workplace. And I sort of kind of alluded this in my um, actual essay during my graduate thesis, actually, what diversity in the workplace actually means. Um, it, it brings a plethora of benefits. When you hire people, people from diverse backgrounds, nationalities, cultures, you're bringing a fresh array of perspectives to the table. And I, I always say, let that sink in. It's not simply because a person is from a different country or they have a certain ethnicity that that's how, that's how you effectively make change in diversity. It's bringing that, all of that together, bringing that melting pot together and understanding what it is that they have to bring to that table. Um, this can lead to better problem solving and increased productivity. It, it, it's a fact. I mean, there's research that backs it up. I believe 60%, there's an increase by 60%, um, there's an increase of productivity if you do hire people from different backgrounds, ethnicities, ages. Um, so diversity doesn't simply just mean like a person of color. It does mean you have all of this encompassing. It could be a person who has a skill in communications in journalism. It could be a person who has a, a skill in engineering, but is focused more on IT. It, it, it's, it's a mix of things, but realizing that that is also diversity is something which I am trying to bring out at Boeing. Um, I like to bring this sort of, uh, I guess, idea or of, of this synonym I get to the table or, or whatever not. It, it, think, of, think of diversity as a scavenger hunt, really. Um, will you find success by sending everyone on the team that you work with or the group that you work with in the same direction? Or will you be able to gather information quicker by having a team that splits up strategically? That's how I sort of think of diversity. And that's how I sort of think of diversity at Boeing. Um, Boeing, like I mentioned, is that global aviation company and everyone is in so many different places at once. So how do we use that to our benefit? We have these big teams, huge teams, um, and we, we work in such niche sort of projects. How do we bring that together and make sure that Boeing still stays the top most aviation company in, in the world? Um, that's what I kind of do. And then I start, I try to make it fun, of course, with the newsletters here and there and just kind of uh, do these surveys here and there just to get people in, and engage them as to what their thoughts are. Um, but then again, like I mentioned, diversity, just it's not just one thing. It evolves and it constantly evolves over the years. It's not, there's no way I can be an expert in diversity by tomorrow. It's going to, I'm going to be continuously doing that research and understanding as to what that actually means and hopefully uh, be a little bit more eloquent next time I speak and when it comes to diversity. <laughs> Um, it's something that I'm hugely passionate about for sure. And uh, I, I guess that cross-cultural experience that I do have as that first generation, it, it's brought me to bring um, that compassion towards this, uh, this, I wouldn't say issue, but this evolvement of diversity and equity and inclusion within the workplace. And so that's what I really do try to focus on um, and bring my communications and storytelling skills to, the, to that front. 
Oh, wow. I'm so glad that you love what you do. And that analogy that you used for the scavenger hunt, all oh, that just like clarified that, that word that even though like it seems so easy to define, it's so much more than that. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanted to talk about, um, I guess, your beginning and then where, where you started. And I guess that leads me to the, my question of why did you choose UW Tacoma to study here for your undergraduate education? Yeah, my beginning was a rocky one. <laughs> I, I, will, I will be transferred. It was definitely uh, not, not what I wanted it to be, but I'm, I wouldn't have had it any other way if, if I look at it right now. Um, I say that, I say, I say this to everyone, <laughs> especially during interviews. Uh, I was to be a pre-med student. I actually was focused, I was two years into my biology degree and focused on becoming this pediatrician. Um, because that's what I was told to be. Um, when you have immigrant parents who've migrated to the United States without really any family, and um, from the country that we're from, Kerala, India, there's pretty much three degrees that you kind of focus on. It's either doctor, engineer, computer science, um, IT, professional of any sort, or business. And uh, these were the only three items, so I thought, pediatrician, why not? I was good with kids. It was something where I was still able to be compassionate, um, listen to people, help people, and I just wasn't happy. Uh, I, I was good at it. I'm not going to say that I wasn't. I actually did fairly well in the sciences, but I was more interested in understanding people and what is it that they want to convey and tell. Um, I realized that probably halfway through my uh, biology degree, actually, that I was more passionate about the nuances when people speak and the nuances when I see people interact with each other. And it happened by accident. I actually transferred um, from, I believe, Green River College to UWT because I wanted to go into um, the healthcare leadership program. So I thought, well, if I can't be a pediatrician, I would go into the healthcare business side of things. And so I saw the healthcare leadership program at UW UWT, and I was asked to take electives before joining um, th those courses. And it was actually, uh, I took a course called Mass Media, Intro to Mass Media Communications with Alexander Nutter, and I fell in love. Um, not only did Professor Nutter actually encourage me to sort of push the boundaries as to the diversity aspect of mass media communications, but she also sort of encouraged me in that class in general, opened my eyes as to what communications could actually be. It could be pretty much anything you put your mind to. And I mentioned that one word, multi-potentialite. That is how I actually sort of resonated with the communications field because I could, I am this individual who wants to do multiple things at once. And I saw communications at that opportunity. And so, um, I ended up at UWT. I switched my major to mass media communications um, with the minor in nonprofit because I have a passion for nonprofits and I've been a part of nonprofits throughout my entire life. And it, it, it just was just an amazing involvement. Um, I was hesitant. I was a commuter student as well. And so ending up, it was about 20 minutes from my place. Um, so I just drove every other day, essentially. And that frustrated me a little bit because I couldn't be on campus for so long and I just didn't like traffic. But the interactions that I've had with the professors and the students, and especially when I ended up as the news editor at The Ledger, it, it just opened my horizons, essentially. Um, I see Bill Coons on this call today, and he is the, one of my closest and dearest mentors to this day. And I actually believe I did a thesis with him during my undergrad on diversity in the workplace, as well as uh, film, um, in, in terms of Indian film and in, in communications. And so I was able to experiment with a variety of things, and uh, UWT brought that to me. It, it wasn't so much that I sought it out, it, UWT presented these opportunities. Um, and so I'm forever grateful and so, so happy that I ended up at University of Washington Tacoma and uh, will ever, forever be in the university stead. It's so heartwarming to hear because like, I, a lot of immigrant students, a lot of immigrant children, they always like fall in that, during that same path of what their parents like, know what's best for them because, because we know what the difference is from living here and how much, how much more like education could bring for you. But, the, they're so they're so narrow in what you what they think you can do with your education. So it's really cool to see how you branched out and how it actually happened by accident and how you had that set path, but then found a way to break from it because because you wanted to do something you were more passionate about. And obviously that's great news for me because I'm kind of in that situation, and I'm just so glad that I'm at that sort of breaking point. 
to kind of understanding what, what I want to do and how I want to do it. And since you mentioned some of your mentors and people who kind of shaped your life, I wanted to know, I wanted to know more about them. Like, how did they mentor you and how did they add to that experience? Absolutely. And I, I'm more than happy to talk about them for ends on me. It just, they have guided me in more ways than I could put words to. Um, as I mentioned, Bill Coons was one of those individuals. He led me to understand communications in such a, I use that word diverse because it, it really is. He brought me to think about journalism in a different manner. He taught me what film meant. He taught me what writing actually meant. He taught me what public relations could actually be. And he really challenged me in terms of what, how I could write. Um, and, and he's always been sort of that confidant for me as well. He was one of those mentors who really just sort of encouraged me and pushed me to continue and move forward. Um, and when I think of uh, Bill Coons, actually, a quote does come to mind. Um, and I think he probably alluded to this, may not say these exact words, but if you ever do fail, never never think of it as uh, as your failure. Think of it as a step into learning. And when I um, think of the word fail in general, I sort of put an acronym to it, first attempt in learning. That's what fail is. I don't think Bill Coons actually said that exactly, but he might have alluded to it. <laughs> but he always mentioned any experience that I do get, think of it as a learning and a stepping stone, essentially. And that's exactly what my life has been since leaving <laughs> University of Washington Tacoma. It's just been one thing after another. Um, like with many students or many students who are, going, are about to graduate, the idea of what comes next um, has always just been a struggle. And I was one. I was one of those many students who just didn't really know where it is that I end, would end up. Um, and so Andrea Wynn, who was a former career counselor out there um, at University of Washington Tacoma, she helped me. She also pushed, helped me push those boundaries as to understanding what it is that I want to do and how I wish to make that impact, how I'm able to really create that legacy. She actually gave me the word multi-potentialite. Um, and ever since then, she told me, that's your word, own it, take it with us that you will and use it use that ability of being that multi-potentialite at wherever it is that you end up. Um, and she's traveling the world, she's making a difference. She still inspires me, we keep in contact to this day. And she's always just, she, these individuals always check in on me. Um, and the one individual who I will say, they weren't at U University of Washington Tacoma, this individual has just been a mentor and encouraged me to really, um, I guess, take that leap of faith and uh, go into the communications field. His name is Joe Abraham. Um, he, like I mentioned briefly with a, within our culture, that the first generation immigrant parents really don't understand what it means to go into a different field. And so this individual, he is like my big brother at this point. Um, he's from the same culture. He actually immigrated here to United States and um, from India. So he was, he broke out of that mold essentially. He, did, he didn't want to be the doctor. He didn't want to be an engineer. He went into social services and uh, he saw that I was, I wanted to do more essentially. And uh, I, I didn't really know that I wanted to do more in time. <laughs> and so he, he told me, well, you, you do a lot of different things. Think about communications. Your school has that. Your university has that. Take that leap of faith and jump into it. And then I jumped into it because I was pushed. I was literally told, just go, take, just take that leap of faith. And that's how I really ended up as to where I am. So I give most of my credit and my life's work to him. Um, he and I, we worked together on various nonprofit boards. We worked on various projects, um, which I will, I will hugely credit uh, Tim for. Um, and just just being at University of Washington Tacoma, the, the skills with communications, people like Bill Coons, people like Andrea Wynn, Alexander Nutter, uh, Randy Nicholas, these individuals really did help me make a difference. Um, they they knew me as a news editor out there. They, they always asked me, what's the next story coming out? Or, or when's the next, what's this article about? Or, or did you want to look at the, take a different angle or a different approach at this? And so um, they've always just been there as individuals who I can just talk to. Uh, and that's, I think, the most important thing whenever you especially people who are looking to go and advance in their professional area, you do definitely want to befriend a professor, a mentor, um, because they have experience that we don't have. We're, we're still learning. We're still gaining the knowledge as to how we're able to implement these skills in the workforce. They've already been there. And uh, I, I just recall listening to their stories and just being absolutely fascinated as to how did you actually get there? or What is it that you actually did? tell me more. I want to do that myself. And uh, just listening to their stories really made a difference. And 
having them listen to me and my aspirations, I think that was the biggest, um, the biggest benefit that I, I will take away and forever, ever, ever be in, be internal gratitude to these individuals. Um, and I hope they won't run away or <laughs> I hope they stick by me um, and everything that else that I hope to uh, accomplish. And so thank you, all of you. Speaking of those like people with great stories, like Bill, Bill Coons definitely has the best stories. He does, he <laughs> I love, does. I love hearing <laughs> everything that he says. And yeah, I, I didn't think I'd get so close to some of my professors, but Bill is definitely one of those people that I just love to be in his presence. It's so great. <laughs> yeah, I loved hearing some of like recognizing some of those names that you threw out. And I just feel like I'm in great hands in terms of my education. <laughs> Definitely yeah. Speaking of education, now, do you have like any significant learning experiences that really stuck with you during UW Tacoma? Like that one moment where things made sense or things that something that you learned the most doing? Uh, my experience, with UW, I mean, it, it was very interesting. Like I mentioned, I sort of ventured in the communications um, the, the major in all aspects. I went into journalism. I looked at journalism. I looked at film. I looked at um, mass media communications, obviously. So all forms of media. I looked at the culture aspect of communications. Um, and so I had a lot of different moments, learning moments. And I was fascinated by all of that. Um, as a creative individual, I was fascinated by the film side um, as I ventured into film for a little while. Um, prior to or in between oh, while I did U University of Washington Tacoma stuff. Um, when it came to journalism, I was the news editor of the ledger. So I was fascinated with how I could further my skills as a journalist. That's how I was able to attain all these interviews that I've had done. Um, same thing goes with culture communications. That's how I understand or understood how, how important diversity is and what actually diversity really means. It's not just nationality. It's not just people from different backgrounds. It means a multitude of things. Um, and so it, everything was very different, but I would say the biggest moment for me that stuck out was, it was probably during my time, um, I, I think I was actually taking a class <laughs> with Bill Coons during this time. And I, me being the news editor, there were times where I would have to step away from class. And got, uh, Governor Jay Inslee was actually on campus and I was told that I needed to be the one to be there to report him. There was no other reporters. And I thought, okay, fine. I would have to miss out on Bill Cousin's lesson, but he was understanding of that. And he actually gave me pointers as to how I may go about it. Um, the one thing he didn't give me was how fast Jay Inslee could walk. <laughs> and that was the only thing, but the way and how the mannerisms, like which focus, what question should I focus on? What currently matters at that current moment in time? How are you as a news editor going to be able to incorporate this to make sure that it affects the students? He asked me those questions <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, in that case, I'm, I have to go and do this. And so that was the big moment. And I went to him with the article and he gave me edits. He gave me advice. You may want to look at it this way. And it was a quick turnaround, actually. I only had about maybe, I think, 24 hours before publication. Um, during the time, it, it was a little bit different. And so I, I had a very, very... Uh, I guess unique experience in that aspect. I had to figure out how to time manage mm -hmm. as to, okay, I have a project that needs to be done. I also have a class that needs to be done. How about do I go doing this? Um, and luckily I had professors who were flexible enough. And I think that was hugely key for me. That, that made me understand the importance of relationships. Um, establishing the relationships with your professors. You're going to have to do the same thing when you go to the when you go to the workforce. You need to establish those relationships with your mentors, your managers, your teammates, because you yourself alone can't do everything. You need to have that team to back you up. You need to have that manager to back you up. And the only way that's possible is to establish trust and that uh, network of connectivity. And so. I think that's the biggest takeaway that I've had at UWT. Um, like I mentioned, I've had all these mentors, amazing mentors who were there, and that was only possible because they were able to open their doors to me. And so um, that's one thing that I highly encourage every student. If your professor has an open door policy, take it, use it, talk to them, just have a conversation with them, have a tea time with them or take them out for tea, whatever. Just have that conversation with them to really establish that connectivity so that they're able to also give you their experience, lend that, uh, lend that hand to you. And um, so you're able to further evolve and go to different heights. And so I, it was a multitude of things, like I mentioned, but um, they all resonated with me and brought me to where I am today. 
Oh, thank you. I loved how that moment was you preparing for an interview. And speaking of interviews, I wanted to ask, of course, you've interviewed so many, like, so many people, like such as Barack Obama and Governor Jane Inslee. Can you please tell us about that? We, yeah. We walked really fast. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jane Inslee walked very quickly. I think it was the height difference for sure, but uh, we kept up. <laughs> um, when it came to former President Barack Obama, um, it was because I was the news editor at the Ledger, and I will—I'll be, I'll be proud to say this—the legacy that I, I created at the Ledger was simply because I was able to extend my voice, and uh, of course, with Andrea's help and um, my other mentor, Joseph Abraham, his help, Bill Coons's help, they encouraged me to reach out as a complete stranger to these individuals and networks, like say, go to the AP Press, register there, um, put your name on that plate, understand that be there. I mean, they encouraged me to really, really push my boundaries there. And so with President Barack Obama, I was selected with, I believe, 20 other um, student journalists. And it was, I believe, around the time of the election, 2016 election. And um, every, most of my interviews were conducted around that time period, the 2016 election, which was an unforgettable moment. I still remember being in the Ledger newsroom, and that changed my life altogether. But um, with President Barack Obama, I was selected with 20 other students to talk about and convey the importance of the Affordable Health Care Act, the Obamacare at the time. And I, I didn't really know this. I knew the topic was going to be the Affordable Health Care Act. And uh, I remember this. It was a phone call. It was a phone meeting. And us students, we were we were called at a specific time. They asked to verify our, or I guess our name and whatever not. And then we were introduced into the, I guess the president's office or we were conferenced in. That was how that interview occurred. Um, and that may sound very, it, it may sound cliche or it may, it may not sound as a big moment as many other people may think, but for me, and that's I guess when I realized the moment, any interview that you have or any interaction with any sort of, in, in, individual who has laid their, I guess, uh, legacy for the world to know, such as Barack Obama, such as Jay Inslee, such as uh, Pramila Jayapal, such as Edward Snowden. They have their, they've established themselves within the nation. They establish themselves to the publics. No matter how small, how short, how, whatever the topic may be, that interview, that moment, take it. Uh, it, it establishes yourself as as you've mentioned. You've now noted me as someone as who's interacted with Barack Obama. Yes, I've interacted with him. I still have the recording to this day where he speaks my name, saying thank you, Angela Suresh, for attending this call, and I have it <laughs> to this day. Um, I, even with uh, Jay Inslee, um, from Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, my absolute hero, Edward Snowden. That one question that I asked him during the <laughs> the meeting of the AP conference, those all matter. Um, they may be short, they may be quick, they or they may be super long. Um, it doesn't matter. It, the, the point of the matter is you had that opportunity to interact with this individual and they were able to share their experience, their knowledge as to what this actually means, what this actually means to them and how you need to tell that story. And that's when I realized the importance of storytelling. That's when I realized maybe journalism is not all what I want to be able to do. I want to be able to convey the importance of what people want to tell, the stories that people want to say. And uh, I, like I mentioned, the interview with Barack Obama, I was able to, I hopefully was able to do a justice with the um, Affordable Hair Care, the Obamacare, that article with Jay Inslee. I believe he spoke of the same topic. Um, also in regards to the 2016 election, Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, it was after the 2016 election. So she had quite a bit to say, and I had an unfortunate opportunity to have about an hour interview with her. Um, same in Edward Snowden, it was in between, uh, and I had one question to ask him in about 15 seconds, and it was just asking as to where his locate, where he was located, essentially, and why he's there, and would he come back in 15 seconds? And so, each of these moments were hugely important to me. Um, I wouldn't consider them interviews; I would consider them stepping stones as to where I hopefully will end up in the next few or a few months, and um, they actually have. And so. Uh, if, if there's one piece of advice that I'll give to any ind individual or student who's wondering as to oh, how does she do it or can I do that or, it, 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 or is it possible that it's too far out of reach? It's not. If you're persistent enough, if you have the resilience, if you have the grit to go after something, 
go after it. And that's exactly what I did. That's exactly what my mentors told me to do. Um, no matter how many times I may have fallen down or felt like I wasn't able to get anywhere. I've had these interviews. I've had, I've spoken to these individuals. I've made it to, and I've had these inter internships. Uh, what more can I do? And so it's just a matter of pushing yourself and um, showing that grit and compassion as to what you do. And you're able to do it. If you want to interview Barack, Barack Obama, I'm pretty sure you're able to do it. Just email him relentlessly right now. And I'm pretty sure you're able to get that interview. I'm sure of it. <laughs> oh gosh, Angela, I could just listen to you forever. I feel like you're talking to my soul right now. <laughs> and I just love the way that you that all these experiences kind of come together. And you're right, it does kind of feel like fate, like all of that stuff just kind of falls into place. But of course, it's because of your grit, it's because of like what you're doing to accomplish it. And it's so inspiring. And I just love hearing about your journey. Thank now, you. what I do want to know is if there's something that you could do, like if you could go back in time and do it again, what would you do differently at UW Tacoma? Is there, is there something you would have, like a class you would have taken or um, something else that you would have wanted to delve into deeper? Yeah, I think the one thing, as I mentioned before, um, I was a commuter student. So I wasn't on campus as often as I would have liked to be, if I think about it. I mean, I was on campus often enough, but not as often as other students. And um, I think that was the one thing, if I can think of anything throughout my UW journey, it was because I was always commuting back and forth. But that also being said, I was doing a lot of different things at once. Um, and I think that probably, I had this mindset where I, because I am coming from this background where I really had no one else to rely on other than my mentors. And the, and I don't really have anyone else to really guide me or hold my hand through it all and say, hey, I'm gonna give you a job at the end of this. This You're gonna, you're gonna get this job, no worries about it. Um, I, I had to do it myself and I felt like I put that pressure on me. So. Yes, I was a student at UWT, but I was also doing these interviews with uh, individuals for the ledger. I was also trying to get internships, get that experience. I was also trying to, who knows what else I was trying to like, help the nonprofit that I was with at the time. Um, build up my resume, build up my website, blog. I was doing so many different things at once that I wasn't able to actually enjoy the student experience. Um, and I, I think that's my one biggest regret. I actually wasn't really a student. I, I was always just working and uh that's I, I think i was kind of alluding before the meeting actually like i i honestly had no time to just simply sit down and really enjoy myself it was i i was running around doing essays i was trying to network i was doing this and that and yes it got me here but at the same time i wasn't a student and that's the one thing if anyone asked me about my student experience this was my experience it was great yes but i wasn't able to really interact with other students other than for the ledger pieces or with classes and group assignments and that was pretty much it i kept it at a very professional level and i realized that that, that that's a benefit of course but also my downfall where i wasn't able to establish those student relationships that i others are able to do um and so if there's one thing that i would do is probably be on campus a little bit more and uh interact with my peers and uh, just just be a student um be my age at the time um and i i think i probably I don't, I mean, I don't regret it for sure, but that's the one thing that I would try and kind of work to amend, if, if anything. Yeah, you were always on that grind to get all those opportunities. I can, I can imagine how like time consuming and how busy your schedule would have been. So, there was no sleep. <laughs> yeah, I guess, um, I had something I wanted to ask you about about that experience um yeah i wanted to know um oh no i think i lost it i'm so sorry <laughs> no don't apologize at all well let me ask you this in terms of culture and values at university of tacoma uh how do you see the communications industry or the communications major developed from when i was there have, have you seen an increase in diversity um for people like myself and alumni and students like you who are just about to graduate or hopefully graduate what do you hope to see from individuals like me speaking in front of you and what do you what do you want uh from us as uh, alumni speakers uh what experiences do you want to hear is something that i i'm always curious of oh 
I definitely, I, I'm definitely super happy that I'm the one who's able to talk to you because from hearing your story, I just see so many things that overlap and how I was kind of in the same situation that you were in, but I'm just kind of living it out right now. So it's, it's really cool to have so many different kinds of speakers and get to know, get to know like what it took for them to, to achieve where they are. Cause it's almost kind of, I can kind of see myself putting your shoes and it's almost like kind of glimpsing at what the future could be. And so your words and um, though the way that you talk about how you achieved all this, these things, it's, it's so very inspiring and that's something we definitely need. And in terms of like what I've seen and in, in terms of diversity, um, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, in my classes with Bill, he does show us like a few of the videos in, in his video production classes. And so I kind of get a glimpse of what Yudab Tacoma was like before and compare it to at least what Yudab Tacoma was when I was on campus and just compare how much that's changed in terms of just like the school's um, students and who, who comes there and how many people come there. It's, it's like, it's beyond just like, um, cultural diversity but it's just seeing like how, you know it's just seeing like how different and how much it's expanded since the commuter college that it was absolutely absolutely thank you so much um i think what i wanted to let's let's do a little fun little question if you were to compare your work environment to a tv show which one would be <laughs> Oh goodness! I I was <laughs> I don't watch much TV, but <laughs> let's see the a couple of shows that I do watch. I I can't really I wouldn't say that my work life environment is that exactly, but the one show that comes to mind I don't think I, many people have watched or heard of it, or if they do, great um, is a uh, Burden of Truth. Um, I think Kristen Kruk is in it, and it, it it's I think a show in Canada, if anything. So they have excellent shows. Um, but I say Burden of Truth is because it's based on a female lawyer uh, who who is just pretty much exactly kind of how I describe myself um, with grit. She is focused purely on professionalism. She wants to get her work done. She just wants to take the case, the best case possible, and move forward with that, no matter the consequences initially. And that eventually evolves when she starts realize, realizing that um, the case that she was on initially, I, I guess it was uh, for a small town and these girls were infected with a sort of disease from a vaccine. Um, she realized that these are young girls and they don't deserve to be put out, out like that essentially. And so from being, I guess, the uh, opposite attorney, she became their defense attorney and evolved into a case of compassion and then She've had, she's had these mentors essentially are, are unknown mentors. These mentors pop up out of nowhere. And then uh, her former mentor or I idol changes into something else. And so it's a show where if I think about my current work environment, um, Boeing is a place where there's constant change. And I work on one thing and then it changes into something else. And a lot of what Boeing deals with is a lot of as I briefly alluded to in the beginning, very sensitive material. We're working to build our reputation up. And so a lot of, during the initial stages when I started at Boeing, was simply kind of putting things aside because it's not relevant to building that reputation or it may not work or it may tarnish the reputation a little because we're being too transparent. Now, the one thing that I realized with that show as well, if I think about it, is um, transparency. I, I own the work that I do. I know exactly what it is that I do. I know my statement of work and a part of that is to build the trust and transparency and be transparent with the public as well as our employees. And so I would put my foot down just like Kristen Kruk's character and when I feel something is wrong. I will sternly put my foot down and say, I'm sorry, I don't believe in this. I don't believe that we should take this approach because of XYZ factor. And then I would do a little mini investigation as to why that is and see if there's a history behind it. And uh, develop that further, develop my case further, um, essentially, and build up upon that case and convey it to those individuals who say, no, I, I, I don't think we should be putting this out to the public for whatever reason. And I will build that case up. I was actually told by um, my, my mentor, Joe Abraham, about this once. He's my constant guide. And same with my mentors at Boeing as well, my former manager, Madia Logan. She was the one who always encouraged me, no matter what project you end up on, 
put grit into it and be upfront with these individuals because Boeing is a century plus year old company. They are stuck in their ways. You are a brand new individual. You are hired because of your background. Bring your background into this. Put your foot down if you feel something is wrong. Go with your gut instinct. And that's exactly kind of what I do um, on, I wouldn't say on a day-to-day -day basis, but every other day almost for a lot of projects that I do at Boeing. Um, and so I guess burden of truth is the closest thing because I, I am, I'm, I'm a hard worker. I'm gritty. I, I do my research. I make sure that I'm all in in a project. But if I feel something is wrong, I step back and I bring my compassion and empathy into it. And then I, of course, go about in a very professional strategic manner as to how to convey that. And so that show is one that I could think of. <laughs> okay, by the way, I think I just, I just remembered what my question was. And it was oh. just a really quick one. Um, you were talking about always being on the grind and having no time to do things that you kind of enjoyed during your time as a college student. But I wanted to ask, like, did you enjoy being on that grind? Did you like always being on top of it? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I, I am a person who cannot sit still for a moment. That's why I, me sitting down for an hour just talking is very difficult for me because I rather, I'm a person who's like, okay, I could do this instead. I could update a website or I could help fix this problem at work or continuously work on that development or communications plan I'm working on. Um, I, I thrive in it, actually. Uh, it's something where I'm a very strange individual where I like high pressure environments to an extent. <laughs> and so, I, I don't mind being on the grind for sure, if that's the case, or the hustle, because it brings out different ideas in me. But that being said, I also am, am a human being. I know when I get burned out. Um, and so I try not to push myself too much, especially these days, uh, just because I do want to enjoy life at some point. <laughs> I do want to enjoy the little things. And, and so, yes, I will work endlessly on hours. I will make sure the project is filled or whatever it is that I'm working on is done with quality and excellence but I'm also human. I would like to uh, enjoy life every now and then. So I do take those breaks here and there and just sit, sit aside and binge on Netflix or um, read a book on Barack Obama. <laughs> so I do what I can. And yeah, speaking of adjusting to this situation, I definitely also want to know how you have been adjusting to COVID-19, how much it's impacted your life and what you're doing to kind of self-care and make sure that you have it that your emotional state doesn't get affected yeah um COVID-19 came it, it was interesting to me I, I just I had I just joined the company at Boeing um actually my year anniversary just occurred a couple days ago and uh I, I believe two months in or I mean it was in December so the COVID pandemic was just starting to get word um, in the nation and things were being mumbled here and there, but I was still traveling for work. I was still doing my work, still going into the office. And then by the second month in, um, the pandemic hit. And even prior to that, before the pandemic, uh, December of um, 2019, Boeing's then CEO was let go of the company. So there was already transition happening from the moment that I joined the company. There was constant change already occurring, not even just the CEO. The CCO was also, uh, we were also getting a CCO during that time. And then the pandemic hit. And then we worked remote. A company that's never decided to work remote decided to go work remote. And I think with what I've procured from UWT. So during my final year, year, years at the university, actually, I requested to do some of my classes online, have that hybrid sort of experience because I was doing a lot of travel um, for my internships and just for work that I was doing on the East Coast at the time. And so I've already had that kind of hybrid experience. So the transition to going remote for me wasn't difficult. I actually was okay with it. It gave me more flexibility and I actually work better. I realized while well, I, I'm in my own comfortable environment. That being said though, however, the one thing that I struggled with is I was a brand new individual at a century old company with a team of communicators of about 600. I have yet to understand who my teammates are. I really don't know who it is that I'm working with, interacting with, who my business partners were, who my stakeholders were. I was still learning the company and uh, the pandemic really kind of forced me to put my head down and do the research, network virtually with all these individuals who make key decisions as to how the company is to move forward. And I am to help support that um, in an instant. And so 
it was interesting. I wouldn't say, I would say the transition was seamless for me because I've been used to that sort of environment and that transition of just various changes happening at the company also sort of forced me into really kind of doing a, a lot of different projects at the same time. But the pandemic brought, I would say, the best in me almost. I was also doing um, volunteer work for a nonprofit at the time. And so while working at Boeing, I would help this cultural nonprofit. And we, would, we created a COVID task force at the time. Um, we did a lot of virtual events for our community. We, I was managing the social media of that site on a constant basis. So I was busy during the pandemic. I wasn't really not doing anything. The only thing that I, I, I sort of was a little flustered about was staying in my own the you know the four walls in my house but uh I, I managed I walked around like a uh headless chicken just walking around in circles around my house just to get movement um but eventually we bought a treadmill so now I get that but I I was okay with it um and I found ways to keep myself busy and I think that's the one thing that people in this situation I think throughout the world um is starting to understand that they need to figure out first and foremost as to what it is that they can really do during this time, you have time. You have 24 hours in a day. It may not be enough or it may be too much, but you have that 24 hours, if not 12 hours of that day to do something, actually do something, get something accomplished, whether it be to cook a meal or read a book, um, call somebody just to check up on them, uh, work out a little. This is what you do. This is how we sort of adapt as human beings, especially right now. We have the technology now to do it. We don't have to necessarily wait or do pen mail or snail mail anymore. We can do something with a click of a button. So utilize that. You're, you're still able to interact with people. Utilize that. And that's kind of what I've been doing. So I've never not really been um, static or bored. I've always done something. There, Of course, there have been days in between where I have done absolutely nothing, but I enjoy those days. <laughs> and so um, with the pandemic, I, I would say I almost realized the potential of what it is that I'm able to do with the, um, the confinements that I'm actually in. And so I think that anyone in this sort of situation, no matter what it is that you plan on doing or what it is that you plan on majoring, where it is that you're working, figure out a way to creatively do something, I think. And that's how you're able to sort of continuously um, move in that positive, proactive manner. So that's the one thing that I kind of can think of at this point. All right, Angela. I think after this last question, we'll open it up to a Q&A. And so the last thing I wanted to end on is you have gave advice to current students that like would be in, in their own places, um, depending yeah, just students currently. And I want to know, like, what's like one last piece of advice that you would want them to know or have that, yeah, have them yeah. know? Um, I'm, the one piece of advice I could think of, um, and all of my mentors alluded to this, they never really said the exact words or they probably did, but um, just thinking about it and thinking of my experiences, I have, yes, accomplished many things. Uh, um, that being said, it wasn't the easiest path taken. I, like many others in this world, have received rejection. I have received many, many applications where I said, I'm sorry, we were about to inform you that you are not selected for whatever XYZ reason. Um, I have numerous emails like that, uh, but that never put me down. The one thing where I could think of is by it's a quote by Dr. Abdul Kalam, um, former president of India. He was a scientist, brilliant scientist, um, is that if you get no as an answer, remember no means next opportunity. Um, let that sink in. I think that's the best thing, that best quote that I've ever heard today. Of course, there's other quotes out there, but this one, next opportunity, that's what no means. And I am sure I've received, if not hundreds of rejection letters, but that's brought me to the next opportunity. Right now, my opportunity is with Boeing. After this, it may be with the Biden-Harris administration. So that's how I see it. I, I've received no, but I have another opportunity waiting for me. So just remember that if you receive a no, you will have something out there waiting for you as well. All right, thank you so much, Angela. Now. Now we'll move on to the Q&A and yeah, if you have any questions for Angela, feel free to um, unmute and ask her yourself or go in the chat and then I can ask, ask her for you. All right, from, from Leslie, such great advice, thank you. How do you, who do you inspire to interview in the coming years and decades? 
Oh, this is a good one. And probably the first and the next interview that I hope to do, or just even talk to, um, is Kamala Harris, our current vice president. Uh, she is someone who has been an absolute inspiration. Um, the one thing I would say is as part South Asian and myself being South Asian, to see a woman of that power now in the one of the most powerful seats in the, in the United, in the world is, it, I was speechless that night. <laughs> I, I, I was literally at the end of my seat that entire week. I, like many, many other people, they were, I, I haven't slept um, or I didn't slept during that time. And so she is the number one individual who I hope to have a conversation with um simply just to get her take as how she got to where she is with the grit and power that she she managed to create that legacy that and that that journey that pathway that she paved forward for people like myself absolutely inspiring um people not even just myself even just students like you immigrants in general just the way that she went about it and um the fact that she had that opportunity to to now be the our current vice president um and the the next step she's going to take to lead this nation um she is definitely one person who i like to like to have a conversation with for sure now i guess we're nearing our time we've got a minute left and i'm not seeing any more questions um i'd like to bring it back to shauna mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much, Alex. Thank you so much, Angela. Thank you for being transparent and sharing your experiences. And um, I just want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. Uh, before we go, I just wanted to mention a couple of things um, to look out for. So we do have the UW Tacoma Distinguished Alumni Award nominations open and the deadline is January 6th. Um, so if you know of any wonderful alumni out there doing great work, if you could um, put the word out to nominate an alum, you can go to the website. I'll put that in the chat. Um, also, um, we have our Tacoma Husky Landing Platform live now. So um, alumni, students, um, friends of the university can join that to network with each other, to learn a lot about career paths and use the tools in there. So we uh, encourage you to do that. I'll go ahead and put that in the chat as well. Um, our next alumni speaker series will be January the 15th at 6 p.m. It'll feature alumnus Ngoma Howard from the School of IAS, Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences. Uh, so we'll be looking forward to that. I'll go ahead and put this information in the chat, but just wanted to thank everybody for attending.